and we're getting ready to move into our first conversation for today as we speak about the commemoration of 16 days of activism in Belize. And we have with us at this time uh, Dylan Williams, who is the Monitoring and Evaluation Officer for the National Committee for Families and Children. And we're joined by Cynthia Williams, who is the Human Development Coordinator at the Women's Department. Good morning and Good welcome. Morning. And thank you for being here. Thanks very much for having me. 16 days of activism unmasking the many faces of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Let's begin by having a conversation with regards to the issue of gender-based violence uh, in our Belizean society mm -hmm. and what is being done to either address or bring awareness to this particular situation. Right. Well, particularly um, this year, the 16, um, 16 Days of Activism Planning Committee, which com is comprised of several gov government and non-government organizations, we felt that we really needed to do something different in, in, in terms of how we've approached 16 days of activism. Often there is criticism that you know only during 16 days of activism people hear about things and then after it, things die down. The reality of it all is that in terms of the work that we do, it never dies down. Um, what happens is that maybe we might not put it more too much in focus in the media yeah. um, and that's where I think people might misinterpret as nothing is going on. Yeah. And so that is something that um, not only um, we, we need to maybe work on, but also other organizations. Um, more and more, I think the general public is becoming more aware of the need mm -hmm. of more inclusive and more participatory programmatic efforts, um, mm -hmm. not only by our department, but in general. Yeah. And so this year, um, the selection of the team was, was very key because we wanted to select a message that would ring and resonate with the general public. It wasn't a theme that, oh, it's just out there and that's it. But actually, what message is it that it's giving? Something that the public would actually think about. And that's why we selected a team looking at unmasking the many faces of gender-based violence. Because often there is the myth, the misconception that gender-based violence is only particular to our uh, a segment in within our society yeah. uh, and that th that can be farthest from the truth um, additionally it was an opportunity for us to also in be inclusive of the community itself and the role that each and every Belizean play in, in the work and efforts against gender-based violence and so we feel that by with that message we're, we're including all of that mm -hmm. looking at not only victims and survivors but also looking at the work that different systems and structures are putting in place mm -hmm. um, to, to end gender-based violence and at the same time the work that happens within the families within the different communities throughout Belize and so we really wanted to make sure that that is the message that we bring across in terms of effort um, again, we continue to look at a greater awareness because as much as that work has been ongoing for so many years, yeah. there has been a lot of issues that have impacted negatively um, the work that has already been done. And so it's a lot of one-on-ones, it's a lot of communication with individual groups, with in individual families that we need to do. And most importantly is the work that needs to be done collaboratively. Yeah. It's not only by one agency. And I think that's what we're trying to do this year differently yeah. in terms of how do we engage each other, yeah. um, all the various faces, um, not to say that every single person is a victim or a perpetrator, but rather yeah. each of us have a, uh, has a role to play yeah. within the work of, of gender-based violence. I, I, I think uh, perhaps what you mentioned is a point that we miss very often, which is uh, how this is a great example of a collaborative effort between governmental and non-governmental agencies, even statutory bodies like uh, the NCFC. Uh, let's just talk for a bit about uh, the, the who makes up the committee um, and those agencies that are currently doing work in this area that perhaps are not as recognized as, uh, for example, the Women's Department or Human Services. Well, in terms of the committee, we have, for example, BAPTA, who works with um, persons living with disabilities mm -hmm. um, because they also are impacted um, and they're even more vulnerable because of their disabilities that often yeah. um, limit the, um, the services that they can access. We also have um, PETAL, which is an organization that works mm -hmm. with um, by an um, lesbian woman. We also have some of the UN agencies that also are invited to the, to the group. We have, um, we've tried, we've, in the past we've had a representative of the Council of Churches okay. um, that ha unfortunately you know they have not participating as much for whatever reason but we really try to be as inclusive it's not a closed group 
um, wherever you see yourself placed within the efforts mm -hmm. and you want to be a part of it, you are welcome. Yeah. And, and, and that's why it's not, very, it's not a very inclu inclusive body. Um, this year, really, we even tried to include um, some business um, companies, okay. uh, the city council also in the past and has participated also in terms of what are the acti different activities that they themselves are doing. Um, with their own staff, bring more awareness because that's what we wanted to do, make it a more individual package for them where the business, the organizations take the initiative and, and to say, this is also something that impacts my company, my organization. Mm -hmm. And so what can I do uh, with, biz for example, some of the um, um, companies like uh, Radical and, and yeah. you know, th that maybe you might say, well, what do they have to do um, yeah. with this type of work, but they also play an integral role. Yeah. People work there, and wherever people work, we will have issues such as gender-based violence. Now, looking at the issue of gender-based violence, you know, unfortunately, uh, from the news uh, perspective, the, the main time it's, it becomes a discussion in the wider public. Uh, I mean, we could report on a forum or a symposium or a conference, but the only time people really get the spark is when there's a major crime that takes place. Mm -hmm. um, and it is usually under very uh, sad circumstances, uh, and we usually find that out as, as the story unfolds. Mm -hmm. It shows that there is a great need for us to have a broader conversation about gender-based violence and our own perspectives and views um, that allow for the stigma that mm -hmm. we see as well. Mm -hmm. Where do you find the most critical area that there needs to be education when it comes to gender-based violence? Um, I think that's a very good point. Um, when we look at the, the data coming out of the gender-based violence um, surveillance um, system, we realize that just from about 2012 through to mid-2015, there were just about 3,136 cases of the various types mm -hmm. of gender-based violence. Um, and so you find that the, in terms of the proportion or ratio of women to men, it's a nine, it's an nine, eight to one, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the, the challenges as it relates to, for example, 15, the block of, in terms of affected population, especially women, mm -hmm. is about 15 to 49. You find that a lot of younger women since um, 2012 going on to, to 2015, it has been increasing, um, even going within the 10 to 14 population, wow. right? And so we ask ourselves then, what are these types of issues? And then you realize that um, there's issues, for example, of dating violence, yeah. right? And so we realize and understand that we can't wait, as you said, until the issues surface on the news because then that's really like the end of the road, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, what we've also seen is that the, the cases or the severity mm -hmm. um, of the cases has increased, right? Um, and so when we start looking at, for example, as I said, dating violence, when we start looking at, for example, increased issues as it relates to child abuse, when we speak of um, additional, um, we're, we're you have, um, in, terms of, in terms of younger females being mm -hmm. affected. So those specific type of injuries um, we can focus on, but then we realize also that we still don't necessarily have a good indication of the severity of the problem. Yeah. Because although we have 3,000 plus cases, um, there's a lot of um, issues as it relates to And that's barriers. just what's reported. Yeah, that's just what's reported. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and so we look when we look at when I did a quick analysis of the data, we see that, for example, Corozal and Cayo are the two highest um, areas of reporting, mm -hmm. right? But when we look at Toledo, there's less um, cases. So you might first at the, at the first instance of looking at the data, you say, well, nothing's really happening in Toledo, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily the issue. You look at, for example, um, barriers to, to reporting, yeah. right? Um, Some of the areas are remote. Yeah, so oh, to the, in terms of the areas are remote, um, you have maybe there's not necessarily a station, there's not a, um, a hospital or a clinic in that, in that area. So, you know... Um, or cultural views and perspectives. Exactly. Or, and so yeah. those are some of the um, continued challenges I think uh, we have to overcome, as um, Cynthia was speaking of. You know, so it has to be a society-wide issue. We speak... While it's, uh, we understand that it uh, disproportionately affect women um, as, it relates to, as it relates to more cases 
against women, we also have to understand that um, tackling it would not, is not necessarily, we cannot necessarily just focus on that. We have to focus on ensuring that, for example, male or men mm. involvement, um, not just when they reach men, but when they are boys, when they are young boys, right? And so um, as we, if, we, if we go to the angle of um, solutions mm -hmm. and we start to think about long-term solutions, we have to start thinking from the individual level. We have to start thinking at the institutional levels. Mm -hmm. We have to start thinking at the society level because it really starts off with the systems or the dominant systems in one which we live in. One of the questions, right? before you go, so, sure. what, one of the most important things I think that we have to look at are the intersectionalities mm -hmm. um, exactly. when it comes to gender-based violence. And once we begin to do that, then we'll have a, a greater understanding mm -hmm. um, as to what, where, wh what, where do we need to go? Yeah. Uh, because often it is seen in isolation where it is within the family. And yeah. so it, it doesn't, you know, almost like if it doesn't affect me, I don't have anything yeah. to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, it in, in impacts in terms of the support that victims get. It impacts in terms of the support that perpetrators get. And I think that's, the, the, that's why we need to be able to have that discussion because we need to ensure that both men and women are included within the different um, efforts that are done because if we only work with victims then the other sector who you know also need that type of support and awareness um, would be left behind and and uh, in terms of what the ministry is doing we're trying to be more to, to do that um, however we are cognizant that you know there are certain strategies that need to be used mm -hmm. um, to ensure um, that men come on board, particularly because of the cultural innuendos um, well, and yeah. the upbringing and socialization mm -hmm. of what it means, you know, when you behave this way and the acceptance that we've had for so many years. And still have. And still yeah. have. And so when we look at the impact of gender-based violence, it has been present within our midst for years. So we cannot expect that the efforts that we're, do we're having now will make immediate changes. For some, yes, but it ha it, we have to look at more long-term solutions, and that needs to include every single person. There are, you're right in saying in no there, there, there are two things that come to my mind off top when I, when I listen to and I discuss the issue of gender-based violence. You have uh, misperceptions mm -hmm. that gender-based violence primarily only affects women. Mm -hmm and that men don't get involved as victims. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing that comes to mind. And the, the, the second thing is, is the innuendo that as a male victim, you're supposed to either suffer in silence or it goes unreported because a man shouldn't turn up to the police station and report that his female partner is hitting on him. Mm -hmm. I think because of that, a lot of people just kind of stay in the background and just keep it as quiet as possible yeah. mm -hmm. um, and I may be wrong in saying this um, and it may not necessarily be the fault of the agencies involved in bringing about awareness and change but because of the overwhelming numbers of women who are affected or females who are affected by gender-based violence I think society more focuses on the issue of dealing with women who are either surviving or dealing with as opposed to for instance, the men who are also victims. Mm -hmm. it's, ju it's just the, the perception on how we see yeah. things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with regards to the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we haven't talked about, and, and I, I learn more and more when you guys come on, is looking at the different, and this is one area where men can really be affected as well, the different types mm -hmm. of abuse. Mm -hmm. Emotional abuse, mm -hmm. financial mm -hmm. abuse, where you're not allowed to touch a dime until you get permission from mm -hmm. your spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, these, I would imagine, are, le are harder to report. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you educate people mm -hmm. on, uh, we know if somebody has a cut, a bruise, right. a broken mm -hmm. bone, uh, mm -hmm. a near death experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are stories where people run out of their houses to save their lives. Mm -hmm. um, but when you talk about the other aspects, the psychological abuse, verbal, the financial yeah. abuse, the verbal abuse, mm -hmm. uh, how do you help people to understand uh, that those are actually uh, considered mm -hmm. gender-based mm -hmm. violence as well mm -hmm. and can be reported. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think, and, and, and we have to do it, like I said, in terms of discussion and the overall awareness that we have to do, and not only the department, but also other organizations. The role that we're trying to play now is to ensure that other organizations have, has that, inf have that information. Mm -hmm. um, because we, 
when we look at, at our, our human resources, you know, we have one officer in each district in terms of women development officer. We do have um, community development office in terms of the three departments that the ministry is responsible for. And so, you know, that's very limited. And so what we're trying to do now is to build the capacity of people within these communities and through the BA1 project that we implemented um, which com was completed in April May this year that's one of the strategies that we use mm. working within the local communities um, looking so how one to one. right you know having sessions in these com communities that maybe we've never done before looking at San Isidro mm -hmm. down south um, looking at some of the rural communities, you know, in, in the different cluster areas in San Pedro, in Kikaka, and that increased awareness in terms of people within those communities to have that information and to allow them to understand um, that it's not only the aspect of physical abuse. You have to look at sexual harassment as well, because we mm -hmm. are uh, unfortunately have normalized violence mm -hmm. in so many ways. And so often we don't look at things in a way that objectively and critically say, you know what, that is not right. That is violence. And so that really um, impacts the, 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 the amount of work that can be done and the engagement also, because it's often perceived almost like, I am going to tell you what you need to do and how to live your life. But the reality of it all, once their choice of any individual is removed yeah. and their ability to make their own decisions, you know, we have to we have to move in and support that person. I love the point that you touched on in terms of what we have normalized. And, and I want to bring in two things. Obviously, two weeks ago, we had a conversation with the counselor from the University of Belize who initiated the first ever uh, campaign against sexual uh, street harassment, mm -hmm. which is considered a form of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a momentum they hope to build, and I think it really opened an aspect of the conversation that we were not having before, mm -hmm. which is targeting a woman and using derogatory language to them uh, without their consent at mm -hmm. all is, mm -hmm. is a form of violence. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about what is normalized. Now, we know that typically gender-based violence escalates. It starts mm -hmm. small. It starts with small habits, and then it becomes larger mm -hmm. as and more grave as time goes by. So when you give statistics, Dylan, and I don't want us to miss this point, that 10 to 14 year olds are reporting gender uh, incidents of gender-based violence. I mean, this, these are high schoolers. Yeah. This is even some primary so from schoolers. Primary school, yeah, yeah, it, it floors me because I would imagine they're not talking about street harassment and they're not talking about perhaps somebody called them a derogatory term no. or, or they're talking actual physical abuse or sexual in nature. Mm -hmm. um, this means we have to get to an even younger age to kind of curb this, this behavior. That, can we talk a little bit about the changing demographics as you see younger people being victims of gender-based violence? It goes back to what they experience in their families mm -hmm. and what the, how the relationship that they see their parents or not, maybe not even only their parents, but their other family members, aunts, uncles, older brothers, older sisters, and what, how do they see that relationship unfold, the way that they treat each other and what they would consider normal. Because at the end of the day, um, we have the way that we even speak to each other. It's very mm -hmm. violent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so pe what I'm starting to see and the, the conversations that I have and what I often, you know, whenever you walk on the street and you see clumps of students, you, you, you really have to step back and just listen mm -hmm. to the way that they talk with mm -hmm. each other. And often I am very saddened because there is such a lack of respect yeah. towards each other yeah. in terms of the language that they use. Um, particularly one incident that comes to my mind is this conversation with these two young ladies who are just 15 years old. And the fact that one of them had just had an argument with her boyfriend over the, uh, over the phone and mm -hmm. texting um, because she, they were supposed to meet up you know, after school, yeah. and unfortunately, she, she, she stayed back for whatever reason, and that angered him, that she lied about not being able, you know, mm -hmm. and so whenever you have that, you have to question, you know, the words that, were, that she was describing he used to her, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and her tr saying, I, I need to apologize, when she did not have the fault. They have lived in that environment, and they have seen ways in how they feel blame for something that they never did. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to the family. And that's why the impact of gender-based violence is so sparse, 
so wide because it affects the basic unit of our society. From it stems other social issues, the aspect of children not going to school yeah. because for whatever reason, they may not be, the, the parents may not be supervising them as well, they have their own issues. The fact that young people are getting more involved in crime and violent behaviors because they have learned that in order for them to get something or in order for them to keep the power and the control that they have, yeah. they have to become violent. They when are you, violent. When you look at the idea of the family, for instance, if you look at the the nuclear family, mm -hmm. where you have a mother and a father, as well as a child, there are several children in the household. And you look at the issue of gender-based violence, domestic violence, where the man, for instance, is hitting on the, the, the woman every so often. Mm -hmm. When you look at the psychological effect that that has on children, mm -hmm. and for instance, their ability to either learn or perform well in school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mother and the father are up all night arguing and hitting on each other. Mm -hmm. The child is up listening and seeing. And then you wonder why there's a slip in grades at the end of the semester, mm -hmm. or why the child becomes antisocial, or why the child becomes violent, distance, yeah, yeah. Becomes violent or distance him or, him or herself from that certain parent who they deem to be the abuser or the physical person. Mm -hmm. We don't look at it oftentimes from that perspective. We only, we only, for whatever reason, we only look at the man and the woman. We don't, we don't look at who else and how else the, the impact of this, this whole situation is. Yeah, and I think that, that, that's a point to underscore the reason why it has become a societal issue. Mm -hmm. you know? And so when we speak of um, trying to reverse or even mitigate um, this crisis, as, as I call it, of gender-based violence, it has to be from the early ages that we start to ensure that, you know, we're building in certain morals and principles um, within our boys and girls and ensure that we're not necessarily reinforcing some of the yeah. same ideologies and so that uh, perpetuate that type of violence or that type of stigma, right? And so when we, when we speak of that, definitely, because it affects a child, child abuse is a form of um, gender-based violence and so you have there was an issue, I think, just so in the news um, Thursday or Friday, mm -hmm. right? And so that with a six-year-old, mm -hmm. right? And so when we speak of this, we, it has to be a, collect, a collective effort yeah. to reverse it. And it doesn't necessarily mean short term. It has to be long term. And so we have to sustain these efforts, but we also have to inject new innovative approaches into this process by involving communities. Because yeah. the conversations at the barbershop has to change, yeah. the conversations at the salons have to mm -hmm. change. All of these different areas where we is no, they're, they're known, mm -hmm. you know, to, to also influence and shape the conversation on the media has to change, mm -hmm. right? So. And let's let let's jump into that a bit deeper because I think the community aspect is yeah. important. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a, a a bit of a conversation I'd seen online where people were talking. Uh, someone was saying they saw a domestic violence case. Um, taking place next yes. door and a lot of times people don't know how or when to get involved yeah. I mean you hear a screaming match you say oh that's just you know that's mm -hmm. relationships you don't get involved mm -hmm. in that you hear something that may sound like it's a physical altercation you still are wary to get involved perhaps you call the family violence unit they may respond may not respond maybe you don't see when they respond yeah. and I think there is a sense of not knowing what to do and when to do it from outsiders. Mm -hmm. What is your, uh, uh, your advice to the community members when they detect issues related to gender-based violence, even if it's a case of, of molestation, sexual assault, if you have a, a sneaking suspicion, suspicion that something is taking place in a household that shouldn't be taking place, what do you do? Well, the first thing is to report it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I, I think often, and, and yes, a lot of people don't report it for because they say police might never respond or because they say you know at the end of the day or tomorrow or the they'll day after that they'll yeah. go back but that's that's not that's not your responsibility you have provided a space or or, or, or an opportunity for that particular person to be safe because you never know whether at that particular moment it is a life or death situation yeah. that's one the other one um, that I, I would like to also highlight is to get involved in terms of, as a community. Like you say, you don't know what to do. Find out mm -hmm. how is it that we can become informed as a community. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know what are the laws. I don't know what are the services that are available. Get together. 
yeah. come and say call even in terms of we've been called to go and work with individual groups in, in San Ignacio I was in, um, in, a, in two sessions actually with two groups um, that are trying to form to, to look at how they can be a part of the solution how they can provide support one which is um, a faith-based organization and the other one which is a more faith-based you know many ways but it's more mixed yeah. And so what they're doing now is that they realize that they don't have the information. So they're coming to us. How can you help us? How can you help build our capacity? And these are women and in some cases men who, you know, they're everyday Jane and, uh, and, and John, as if we would call them that way. And so that's the second step to become okay. informed and to make sure that you have the correct information. Now, I have one more issue I want to touch on, uh, and that is looking at what are we saying to perpetrators. Now, I always find it so interesting that society always calls on the women's department to ask, what are you doing for the men mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, <laughs> uh, looking at the behaviors that they have uh, if they're perpetrators. Now, whether or not the women's department is the right agency for that is, is not the point. I think uh, I, I want to look at what we are doing to be able to reach out to perpetrators, to have them understand why they have these tendencies, and what can be done to intervene in the process. At one point, there was a batterers program, that's mm -hmm. what it was called, batterers intervention program. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that still exists. Mm -hmm. um, but what what is being done on that end? I think, you know, we, we place a lot of emphasis on the victim, rightly so, because they're the ones who perhaps leave the most damaged. Mm -hmm. um, but something has to be done to stop the batterer from moving on mm -hmm. to another victim. Mm -hmm. And similarly, very closely tied to that, I want to talk about the white elephant in the room that we don't discuss very often, and that is drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. A lot of the crimes that we see in our country, whether we have been able to make the link or not, mm -hmm. anecdotally we hear from mm -hmm. people, they were drunk, they were high. People oftentimes end up in a situation when their partner is intoxicated and then use that as an excuse. In other words, he, it wasn't his behavior, mm -hmm. it was the alcohol that made him do it. Mm -hmm. How do you address that? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the Bathurst Intervention Program, we're looking at how do we strengthen um, the program. One of the questions that we've asked, been, been asking ourselves actually is, like you said, whether it's the right place for it to be housed. Mm -hmm. in actually in the other six countries in the Caribbean where this program is, 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 is implemented, um, we are the only ones uh, in terms of the women's department or the gender mm -hmm. department that is housing it. Um, particularly because that's where we were at the time. If we really wanted to implement and bring this into Belize, um, yeah, we had to take the, the, the role, the initiative to, to, to spearhead it. But we are looking at how do we then engage other, other, the other sectors, the other partners, and to say maybe it would be better housed there. Um, it's not, it's, it has not been ongoing particularly because we don't get referrals. It's a court mandated program. Okay. So um, court, whenever any first time offenders go to court for whatever um, of the types, emotional, psychological, physical, economical, then they are mandated as part of their counseling or their rehabilitation order to be a part of this. So we're currently revising, um, you know, looking at how can we strengthen it. If it's not here, how if we house it in another area, um, organization, maybe would have much better uh, and successful Let me returns. ask you a question, Cynthia. And, I, and I, I don't wish to be cynical. It's just mm -hmm. as straightforward as, as I can possibly pose this question. We hear about a women's department. Mm -hmm. We hear about all these things being done for women and children. Mm -hmm. But there doesn't seem to be any move you'll correct me if I'm wrong, to have either a, you use the word, I'm assuming you used the word loosely earlier, gender department. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about gender department, I know about women's department, but is there a move in the future, in the near future, to have such a department that looks at men's affairs as well? I use the word to describe what other countries in the mm -hmm. Caribbean mm -hmm. have. That's how they call um, their, 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 that department that de deals with those issues. In terms of what we're doing, um, one of the things that we are currently doing is we are the Women and Family Support Department, mm -hmm. where we have amalgamated the service, adult services, okay. which include men's services, um, as part of this program. Because what we wanted to do is to, if you notice before the family support services was within the Department of Human Services, yeah. um, what also deals with child protection. And so in an effort to strengthen and to, to, to make it more integral, um, <clears throat> we felt that then 
women's department deals with adults and so it would be best place for us to do that and so that hopefully then inc be inclusive more and and people would be more receptive i would i would i also would say though that i think it's not only about the name it's also whether people want to access the services because yeah. we do have men who access our services uh, and so it's it's just a name thing that they're harp harping yeah. on yeah. as an excuse sometimes. That a man doesn't go to the women's Right, department. and we yeah. do have yeah. where, I mean, some of the men that have participated, you know, at the end of the uh, uh, 16 psychoeducational uh, sessions, they, they, were, they recognized that the behavior that they were a part of was, was wrong. Yeah. Violence is a cho choice that they make. Alcohol and drugs is a factor. You know, we just had the discussion with the group on Saturday because they were looking at it as a cause. But mm -hmm. we have to relook at it as a factor because at the end of the day, it only serves as a mechanism that impels them to behave the way that they were already looking it's at. Like they were finding ways, right? Mm -hmm. How do I, I, you know, I already have all these things in my mind. Mm -hmm. So the alcohol and the drugs basically just loosens to me to be able to say and do the things mm -hmm. that I already have in my mind. And so we really want to be able to have those type of conversations. The fact that alcohol is socialize and you know it's mm -hmm. if you don't drink well something something is wrong with you yeah. uh, and that's the reality of it in terms of, of programs for men we have tried in the <coughs> past um, Dylan was, was was part of one and and so part of the reason why we selected the team is to see how we can be more engaging um, the team will be on for the next three years that's a decision that we made as well okay. because hopefully that team will be something that we will be working throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the department does work throughout the year. And so now as a, 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 as a group, we've decided that, you know, it's important for us to focus on something and be able to see how we can strengthen the services that are there. Because like Dila said, although limited, there are services and how can we bring in more services, be more engaging of other organizations who um, can also play a role in terms there are men's groups around the country how can we engage them and be able to say okay this is the information what can you do it's also a sense of responsibility and also a challenge that we have to um, put forward um, to everyone because it's, it's, it has to be a col collaborative effort. Okay, so let's talk about the activities because we're completely <laughs> out of time. Uh, as we said, 16 days of activism, it start, started on Friday, continues right through mm -hmm. to December 10th. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the major activities that people can participate in and perhaps learn more about the issues uh, surrounding gender-based violence? Um, in terms of the um, University of Belize really has been a, a, a great partner this year they've really organized some very good activities um, if you notice there even are some events that the general public can participate in terms of just impromptu, impromptu mm -hmm. sessions out in the public um, the US Embassy also will be organizing similar events okay. um, they have not really given dates and time because they wanted to come as it as a surprise and to just have people there involved in terms of what the, the department is doing and other um, um, organizations is quite a lot of capacity building for their membership mm -hmm. um, and for those that they work with some um, the people the clients that they serve in terms of what is gender-based violence what are the services that are available what is the legislation that is available um, and for us to also engage young men and men in, in awareness raising sessions and, 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 and questioning ourselves and how can we more engaging with you how can we support be more supportive of you what are the things that are needed you know um and at the same time being able to provide more national scope the okay. special envoy the office of the special envoy actually today will be launching several um videos okay. ads that looked at the various forms of violence mm -hmm. um and, and concrete examples um that often people miss uh, because they only see a man and a woman, they only see a lower socioeconomic background, but the fact is, it's across All the board. Levels. On That's Friday right. when we did the official launch um, that was organized in partnership with, with Special Envoy and, and our department, we had three testimonies. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the women that were there, um, like they said, they would consider themselves middle Mm -hmm. um, you know, economic background and, and the, 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 their experience, you know, really spoke to the mm -hmm. impact of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them spoke about her six year old taking a towel and wiping her face that was with blood and mm -hmm. saying, When I get old, I will not allow anybody to do that to you. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that type of experience, you know, for that child and that person, and, and in some cases, where men then who feel completely alone mm -hmm. because they know that when they report. So 
for me, I think one of the things, one of the key messages I also want to challenge the general community is to offer support. Mm. Support can simply be listening and being there for those individuals and telling them this is where you can go and being there for them because that's what as a community we no longer do. Um, All right. Just quickly, just to say that um, maybe one of the key messages to also leave is that once we accept that there is zero tolerance attitude towards gender-based violence and violence on a whole, that is to me the best start. Nothing should be accepted. Well, we want to thank you for joining us to have this conversation. As we pointed out very early in this conversation, it is important that the discussion takes place at a different level rather than okay. reacting when an incident happens to understanding what needs to be done and how we view this issue. Thank you so much. There will be a number of activities that will be happening over the course of the next two weeks, and uh, definitely you should uh, make an effort to participate. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by representatives of the Belize Association for Persons with Diverse Abilities, BAPTA, so stay tuned.